all of you. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate you joining us this morning on Labor Day weekend Sunday. You're sharing Sunday morning with us, and we really appreciate that. I want to welcome those who are watching by live stream as well. Really appreciate you doing that. My name is Joe Lachlan. I'm the lead pastor here. And as you know, we have a rotating team of teachers, and today is my turn to be with you, and I look forward to this all week long, and uh, just want to continue in this series about Everybody Counts. We're telling you that you count. The problem is, is that you and I live in a world uh, that tells us something different. In fact, maybe it's not just our world and our culture, but maybe it's even something at your employer or maybe even in your neighborhood or your extended family, and I even, if I'm honest, say, I got to tell you, I think sometimes you might hear it different from your church, and I don't like that part of it especially. Often what you hear is this, you count if or you count when, but God says you and I count, period, and that's what I want to share with you this morning. Now, my dad used to say things that I really took to heart. Well, to be honest with you, when I, my dad was saying them to me, especially if I was a teenager, I'd roll my eyes or think, well, that was dumb. But now that I'm an adult, I'm going, my dad was a genius. First of all, he figured out how to not kill me. So that was a big thing, all right? That was a real big thing. I would have taken me out. If I, if I think back to when I was a kid, I was like, he's done, all right? But uh, my dad used to say the goofiest things. And one of those things my dad said, maybe your dad said, it sounds something like this. Son, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, and we're all wearing milk bone underwear. That's what my dad would say. And really, that's true. I mean, that's how the world is. That's how life is, you know. It's all this competitive, you know, always got to be at the top, always got to do more. Some of us have lived long enough in this room or watching online to where we have said many times in our lives, if I could just get here or if I could just get to this spot, or if I could just live at this status, or if I could just make this much money, or if I could just accomplish that, then everything would be okay. And we've done this and that and this and that and even that, and we've realized the emptiness of it and how it really doesn't satisfy what we're looking for. So this morning, as we think about how we count in the eyes of God, I want us to look at something Jesus said. Now, we've looked at Genesis and we've looked last week in the Psalms by David's writing, and today we're going to look in the Gospels. Next week, we'll look at something the Apostle Paul said, and then finally, we'll look at something the Apostle Peter said. And I got to tell you something, when you see a theme like that all the way through the Scriptures, Old Testament to New Testament, all these different writers saying kind of the same kind of theme, it's something we should pay attention to, and here's what we're paying attention to. You count, period. And that's what Jesus said. So if you're willing, take your copy of God's Word and look with me in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to spend some time there this morning. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. So open up a copy of God's Word or open up the church app or um, Bible Gateway or whatever. Find Matthew chapter 6. We're going to spend most of our time there. We'll eventually get over into Matthew 10, but for now we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. And this is part of Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount. Imagine, if you will... Jesus speaking before a crowd who's seated on a hillside, thousands of people, and, and Jesus is speaking to them. And it's the masses. It's those who are intrigued by this weird guy that kind of came out of nowhere, and he's doing all kinds of miracles, per se, and maybe even some are following him, and of course, the closest disciples are there. But this is for the masses. And while Jesus is speaking uh, to the masses about God and his way, he says some really counterintuitive, counterculture things in Matthew 6 especially. And in that text, what we're going to see is this. We're going to see that God offers us a solution to that milk bone underwear kind of thing that we all experience. But the problem is the solution he offers to us, we're going to see in the text, is so counterintuitive, it's so counterhuman nature that we kind of have this sort of like stiff-armed resistance to it. If we're honest, we'll admit that today. And I had somebody come to me even after the 930 service and said, okay, man, you were into me. I was like going, yeah, I don't like this. And I'm glad that guy was being honest. There's parts of this stuff that we're not really comfortable with because it is so counter to how we're living our life. And here's what Jesus does. And this is what I hope you'll get before you leave today, finally, is that Jesus suggests to us that we've got to make a flip. We've got to make a switch or a shift in our approach to living. And if we're willing to make that switch, that flip in our approach, 
to living, then what Jesus offers as a solution to us will make a huge difference in our understanding that we count in the eyes of God. Not if, not when, but period to God. So let's look at Matthew chapter 6. Starting in verse 19, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus recognizes that the average human experience, human nature, Human tendency is to try to build up wealth in the material, physical things of this world. And Jesus is saying, instead what you should do is build up spiritual wealth with God. Now let's keep reading, verse 25 through 33. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather crops into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? Did you get that? We are the most important part of God's creation. Literally what he says is, are you not much more valuable than they are? That's the language he uses here. You and I, as we realized from the Genesis 1 account that Josh talked about two weeks ago in here, that we are the most prized part of God's creation. The song Adam wrote and just sang to you a minute ago talks about that, how we are the only part of God's creation in all of the universe that God actually breathed into and gave life to. The rest, he just spoke it into existence, but for us, he intimately breathed into us and gave human beings life from himself. So we are made in the image of of God. Jesus says, don't you realize you are more valuable than all the rest of the creation? So verse 27, in which one of you by worrying can add a single day to his lifespan? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. So if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry then saying, what are we to eat or what are we to drink or what are we to wear for clothing? For the unbelievers, those who don't know God, those who are really invested in the ways of the world, in the Bible terms, that's Gentiles, all right? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus is talking about this solution that he's offering all these people. It's God's way. It's a, it's a better way. You and I have lived long enough in life to know that the more we pursue the things of the world, the things of the material world, sometimes the wheels just come springing off and it doesn't work. Or even if we accomplish it, it always feels like we've got to do more. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, as my dad says. I saw this up close and personal yesterday. I know our beloved Mary Harden Baylor Crusader football team really took one in the chin yesterday. And if you watched the game or kept up with it online, you know how brutal and ugly it was. I was there in person in River Falls, Wisconsin. It was exceptionally brutal in person. It was like, oh, my gosh. I mean, it was horrible. It was, we couldn't do anything right. It was like nothing we tried. I mean, we were tripping and falling coming out of the locker room. I mean, it was just bad. It was just one of those days where you just go, well, we'll have to get better. We'll have to figure this out. No matter what happens, just because we won a national championship two years ago, went to semifinals last year, ranked number three this year, nobody cares about that. It's what you can do in that particular moment. That's how our world works. Jesus is offering a better solution. He's offering this way of God. Now, I want you to see how this is important because I want you to look at verse 24. This is, some, this is the part we, don't, we really resist. This is the part we don't like. 
It's fine for us to think about how, you know, God's wanting us to invest in the spiritual and over the material and all of that. We get that. Okay, sounds like the church thing to say. So the preacher's on it this morning. Okay, he drank his Baptist cup of coffee. He's good to go. He's giving us the shtick. Okay, it's all right. That's the way it goes. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll listen to that. Look at verse 24. What Jesus has to say is something really counterintuitive, and we resist it. Verse 24 of Matthew chapter 6, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The solution God offers us is something we're going to have to realize is an either-or kind of equation. Now, here at First Temple, we like to say that we're a both-and church. All are welcome. It's grace and truth. And we even did a series a few years ago about all the different phrases in the New Testament where it says both and, grace and truth, things like that. But in this instance, what Jesus is saying, I hope you'll take this to heart, whether you're watching online or here in the room, Jesus is saying you can't have it both ways. You have to pick. Because the two value systems are mutually exclusive one from the other. And people go, oh yeah, yeah, but I figured it out. I have found, I found a loophole. I have found, you know, no, you haven't. Jesus says there is no such thing. Listen to what he said. He said, no one, not anybody, not even you, buddy boy, all right? Not, not, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. In fact, that's why he says it the way he says it. Look back in verse 19. He says it a particular way. He doesn't just say, don't do this. Do not store up. This is actually how Jesus, this is how the people on the hillside listening to Jesus would have heard it. He says, stop storing up for yourselves in heaven. Instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Stop. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Stop doing that. Instead, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Verse 28, uh, verse 25, sorry, he says, stop worrying about your life as to what you will eat or drink or for your body, what you will put on it. Stop doing that. It's not just a suggestion. It's actually a command. He says, stop doing this. It gets you nowhere. Instead, do this. Verse 26. Instead, look at the birds. Verse 28. Look, look at all that, that God has done in his creation. Are you not more valuable than they are? The end of verse 26. That's what he, he keeps saying. Instead, look around, notice, observe. See how this works in the ways of God. Stop doing this. Stop worrying. And then I really like the way he says it in verse 31. He doesn't just say stop worrying. He said, now that you've stopped worrying, don't start that worrying stuff back up again. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a, <laughs> I'm a cyclical worrier. Anybody else? Okay, now, are y'all going to be honest or not, okay? I mean, I, you know, look, <laughs> it took me something to get from R River Falls, Wisconsin yesterday evening. Left Minneapolis about 8 o'clock last night to get here this morning. And I told the whole plane with us, I'm like, dude, okay, somebody said, you got to preach tomorrow. I said, yeah, I get to preach twice. That means all you people are getting up and getting dressed and going to church. If I have to, <laughs> if I have to preach, you're going to church, okay? So if you're here, let's just be honest about this, okay? All right? I don't know about you, but I, I don't really like this part of this. The either or thing just really kind of gets me. I'd like to keep a, a, a foot in both, both worlds, but it doesn't work that way. That's not how this happens. And Jesus is trying to help us understand this. He's trying to help us. There's a better way. But the solution he's offering kind of like really bothers us. We have to be honest about this. Somehow we think that our achieving stuff and accomplishing something or giving into the ways of the world that if you count if or when is what matters, when really we're too valuable to God for that. Jesus says, once you... 
Once you've stopped worrying, don't pick it back up. I'm a, I'm a cyclical worrier. I, I, will, I, will, I will worry about things and I'll give it to God. And I'll, I'll bow down and I'll pray. Am I the only one that does this? I'll bow down and pray and I'll give it to God. And then thank God for taking it from me. And on my way out of the prayer room, kind of pick it up and put it in my back pocket as I go back. Am I the only one that does that sort of stuff? Okay, all right, thank you. A few of you are being honest enough. How about you online? Y'all doing okay out there? All right, yeah. Okay, we, we have to really, really be honest about this. If we're going to take time to get dressed and come to church, we might as well be honest, right? No need to keep playing games. So Jesus offers, Jesus offers us this better way. Look in verse 33. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. That word provided is really interesting. Your version may say will be added to you. All these things will be added to you. All these needs that you have that you worried about, if you just seek the kingdom first, all these other things will be added to you. The word added to you is the word from which we get the English version of the word prosthetic. Something added to, an attachment that replaces the original What Jesus tells us here is that you can't treat the kingdom of God like a prosthetic or an attachment, something that is given to you in order to make things work better. That's not how it works. You quit worrying about all the earthly, worldly stuff and make your priority the kingdom of God, and then all the other stuff that you need will be added to you. It'll be a prosthetic for you. We've got it the other way around. We've got it backwards. And Jesus is telling us to stop doing that and start doing this. And when we hear stop and start, well, I know by nature, here's what we do. It's kind of like when my dad would tell me stuff when I was a teenager. Because it was my dad who was telling me it was automatically stupid and wrong. Can I get an amen? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. The condition, the condition that is causing that is called what? <laughs> Adolescence, that's what it is. Okay, that's a, I'm sorry, because we want to be independent. We want to be on our own, and that's natural. But the truth is, this thing we're resisting is actually intended to help us. Here's the thing I want you to see about this in, in, in 633. This is very important for you to pick up on. He's talking about the kingdom of God. We've talked about this a lot. Remember, a kingdom is a territory or domain within which whatever the king wants done is done. So since it's the kingdom of God, God is the king, Jesus Christ is the king, so whatever he wants done is done. His way happens. So when we buy into the kingdom of God and obey what Christ wants us to do, then all the benefits of the kingdom become ours. And oh, also, on top of that, all the earthly things we need are added to our life also. Because God knows we need those things. Now, we have to do some work about what's need and what's want, right? Okay? So we have to do all that. We have to, we have to pack all that out and go, okay, we've got to deal with that issue because really that's not a need. That's so much a want. But, you know, still, God takes care of us. But you and I resist that because we don't like to be told, stop. Instead of this, do this. That's our very nature. It's just our nature to do that. That's who we are as human beings. And so what has to happen is something that I call a flip or a switch or a shift, and it's this. We, we have to realize what we're talking about is what God wants for us rather than what God wants from us. Now, for some of you, that's a cliche, and you're thinking, oh, yeah, okay, right, mm-hmm, yeah. But I really want you to understand that I think this is key for us to be able to buy into the kingdom of God in the ways of God. Here's the thing. Will you look this way? I think most people come from a mindset that God is actually against them. 
and then they have to figure out what they're going to do to get God happy and keep God happy and appease him so that he will give them what they want. That's why most worship across the world that's not Christian worship is designed that way. You do whatever you do, all the little tricks and, and things and sayings and activities or whatever in order to check the box and appease God. And then if you do all those things, then he'll give you what it is you want. That's not how our God works. Our worship is based upon what God has already done for us and we acknowledge it and recognize it and we respond to him in worship and give him thanksgiving because of what he's already done for us. Otherwise, we're treating God like the world treats us, that we count only if or when, when in reality, in God's eyes, we count, period. Now, I want you to look over in Matthew chapter 10 with me real quick. This is Matthew chapter 10. A couple pages over in my Bible. Maybe scroll down on the church app. You'll find it. A couple of arrow clicks to the right over on Bible Gateway if you're using that. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is speaking to a different group. He's speaking to the disciples, just the, just the closest followers. And he's about to send them out on a journey to spread the news of the kingdom of God, God's ways. He's about to send them out to say, hey, you people are all living in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, but God offers you a better solution in that you count, not if, not when, but you count, period. This is what Jesus tells them. It's going to be tough out there. Basically, Jesus gives these disciples the dog-eat-dog, milk-bone-underwear kind of speech. He, I mean, kind of firing them up, getting them ready, okay? And then he, well, look what he says in verse 29, 30, and 31 of Matthew chapter 10. Are two sparrows not sold for like almost nothing? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father knowing. Even the hairs of your head are all counted so stop being afraid. You are more valuable than a great number of sparrows. Jesus is telling these guys, listen, you count so much to God that he even knows how many hairs are on your head. You ever think about that? You ever wondered how many hairs are on your head? Some of you are thinking, well, not as many as there used to be on my head. Okay, guess what? That means God's keeping up with how many number of hair. He knows how many you've lost. That's right. And mine, you know, mine, some of you are thinking, well, yeah, does he know how, which ones are gray and which ones are whatever? You know, yeah, okay. He keeps up with all that. Okay. And like me, I don't care what color my hair turns. As long as it doesn't turn loose, I'm good. I'm going to be all right. Okay. I, I guess what I want you to hear is that God knows you personally. God knows you that specifically. God knows exactly what your needs are. If you and I could just understand that different approach, that, that flip to a different approach to life, coming at it as if God does what he does because and asks from us what he asks, not because he really wants something from us, but because he wants something for us. I've seen this this last year in a particular scene here at First Temple. I've seen it. It happens every Sunday. It'll happen today. At the end of this service, it happens every Sunday. It's a, it's, a, it's a picture, it's an experience of observing something where two people realize that God is for them, not against them, and that he, he wants something for them, not from them. And they don't even realize that's what they're doing because they are children. 
There's a family uh, that has some children, and two of the older children in the family, one of them six, one of them five, older sister, younger brother, one of them six, one of them five, as soon as mom and dad get them out of their children and preschool, respectively, programming down the hall after mom and dad are in here, those children, you, if you'll watch, will run down the commons. And the first time I saw this happen, I thought, well, these kids are excited to get out of church. That's pretty cool. I've seen some adults with that same sort of enthusiasm. It's finally over, you know. And the first time I saw them running down the hall, I noticed mom's face looking at me, looking at the children running, and she thought, oh, Lord, the pastor's watching my children run in church. This is bad. This is bad. And well, to see the look on her face, I thought maybe it would help her to realize I didn't care about them running in church. In fact, I'll just... I'll run with them. So I ran with them. I don't even know why we were running, but I ran with the children in church because I want kids to have a good time when they're here in church. And then I discovered why they were running. They were running to the offering box back here. And I saw them put them some in the offering box, and they were shoving it down in there and having fun, and they high-fived, and then they, then they were ready to go after that. So I asked mom and dad about it, and here's what I found out. Every week, mom and dad give them the, t- the, the family's tithe or offering to give. And rather than putting it in as adults, they give it to their children, and their children take turns running it to the offering box after service is over with. And get that, they take turns getting to put it in there. And even when it's the other one's turn, the other one still runs with an excitement that they get to do this. And I thought to myself, oh, man. That'll preach right there. That's going in a sermon sometime. Because if these children could rub off on us to understand that they, they get it as something God wants for them, that joy that's inside them to get, they don't even have money of their own. It's something God has given them. Hello? It's something God has given them to give back to God. And they're so excited about getting to do that because they realize it's something God wants for them on the inside of their life. And this is what I know is going to happen. As those kids get older and as they become adults, the world's going to beat that out of them like the world has beat it out of you and out of me so that somehow, some way, we've bought into this idea that God just wants stuff from us. And those kids will have to come to a point in their life where they decide for themselves to flip their thinking to switch, to shift back to like when they were children, to trust that this really is all about what God wants for me, not from me. Because in God's eyes, I don't count if, when, I just count, period. Beloved, you count. Let's pray. Would you take 60 seconds to just let that sink in quietly? Or maybe let the Spirit keep talking to you about a particular thing in your life? Or if you are ready to speak to Him about what you've learned and want to change in your walk with Him. Take 60 seconds.